Thanks. So my name is Alexander Azimov. I uh, work for Yandex, and today I'm going to show you how to enrich TCP with self-healing capability. Uh, of course, in the case of network outage. Um, I will start with the example focusing on the data center environment, but as you will see, it's not only about data centers. Uh, the minimal building block in the DC is a rack of servers uh, connected to the top of rack switch. Uh, these top of rack switches are connected to the first tire spines. Uh, on this slide, S11 and S12 represent first tire spines. The set of top of uh, rack switches connected to the same set of first tire spines represent a point of a data center or port. Uh, first tire spines uh, of selected port belong to uh, different planes. Uh, each plane consists of first tire spines and second tire spines or super spines that provide connecti connectivity between ports. I will use uh, literal X uh, to represent super spines. On the uh, top of rack switches and first tire spines, uh, usually uh, used uh, loud balancing and it uses a common five tuple, uh, Protoss, source port, uh, source uh, uh, IP, destination port, destination IP. So I think uh, it's very, very clear. And on another side of fabric, uh, there is, of course, another set of top of rack switches uh, connected to its own first tire spines. It is believed that such topology uh, provides uh, both fault tolerance and easy scalability. Both statements are true to some extent. For example, if we increase the number of planes, we will increase network capacity. But it's really hard to do if you haven't invested in fi uh, fiber in the day one. Uh, so modern data centers provide multiple paths between its points. Uh, the single path between two hosts uh, exists only inside the rack. Uh, if we take a look at the uh, interconnection between inside the port, it will, the number of paths will be equal to the number of planes. If we speak about uh, uh, interconnection between, not interconnection, but the number of paths between uh, hosts in different ports, it will be a result of uh, multiplication between number of ports and number of planes. So just to make you feel the numbers, here is a few numbers from uh, one of Yandex data centers. It has eight planes uh, with uh, 32 super spines. So we have one path inside uh, top of rack switch. We have eight paths in case of interport interaction. And we have 256 uh, paths in case of inter-port interaction. One may expect that this number of paths should provide fault uh, tolerance out of the box, but real outages in the DC are way more complicated. Let's say we have an outage and it uh, affects one of our super spines, X11 and it starts to drop packets that are coming uh, through. If we're lucky, and our automatic tools, for example, PFD, are capable to detect the outage and uh, drop down BGP session, everything will be fine. So the uh, BGP session will be down instantly and the services will not notice any kind of service degradation. But if the situation is different and the control plane for some reason is not affected, uh, we are experiencing a constant packet loss and the situation is quite different. Uh, so since most of our traffic is TCP based, we need to rely on uh, TCP loss recovery me me mechanisms in this case. Case. And uh, there are two common mechanisms. There is a uh, selected acknowledgement and uh, uh, retransmi retransmission triggered by the RTO timeout. 
but all these retransmissions will have same five tuple. So they will all travel the same path. Uh, and uh, of course leads to continuous self degradation. And as the congestion window will be shrinking, uh, it will increase the chances to meet RTO event. And continuous RTO events is a disaster. Uh, RTO is calculated as a minimum from a measured RTT and RTO mean. The default Linux value for RTO mean is 200 milliseconds. Uh, if we are unfortunate enough to lose a synth packet, the basic timeout is even higher, it's one second, while real RTT in the data center is less than one millisecond. To make it even worse, it increases two times after each unsuccessful attempt. So how this problem can be addressed? There are two types of active actors in the data center. There are, of course, services. And they may try to do their best. They may try to tune some TCP options, may try to create uh, software health checks on top of TCP. Um, unfortunately, what proved from my experience, uh, these tweaks and tricks are not that effective. And uh, what more important, they do not scale. And if nothing happens, what? do service teams of course they blame the network team and unfortunately from some of my experience I, at least in our company i learned that some maintainers of services really think that this how things are done in network teams the real situation of course is a little bit um, um, more uh, complicated uh, the classic way is to develop both white box and black box monitoring tools to detect anomalies. The discussion about black box monitoring will take another hour, so let's focus on the timing. It takes uh, a couple of minutes, minutes to collect data and protest data. And af after uh, it, it takes another five minutes to verify it and uh, isolate uh, the broken device. As a result, it's uh, from five, 20 minutes of service degradation, and it's global service and degradation that affects all the services in the data center. And what a surprise, it still doesn't look good for the services. So what is the best way to resolve dependency between network and service degradation? How to make services use unaffected paths for the, uh, in the data center? Uh, and we have many paths in the, the data center. Uh, while giving uh, the network engineers in enough time for trouble to sh shooting and isolation. And the funny thing, uh, solution does really exist. And to find it, we need to carefully read few commit messages in Linux kernel. So let's do it together. Uh, in 2011 was published RFC uh, 6438. Uh, where it was stated that flow label in IPv6 uh, header can be used to balance encapsulated traffic. Um, it uh, was not uh, only for the fabric, but it was just a general case. The idea was simple. Uh, since the transport layer is not available, uh, we can improve load balancing quality uh, if we put the hash of, from the TCP socket in the outer header that is accessible uh, by the network device. In 2014, it was introduced in uh, Linux kernel, and also it was uh, uh, affecting not only flow label, but other types of encapsulation. For example, in case of GRE, it was uh, affecting a GRE key field. In case of uh, UDP encapsulation, it was affecting uh, UDP source port. Uh, but the progress in Linux kernel haven't stopped at this point. It was progressing far beyond IETF documents because it is the uh, age of IET, uh, what, what is writing at the IETF. Uh, the next year, there was another patch uh, in a Linux kernel which added TCP hash recalculation upon negative routing event. What is negative routing event? It is uh, uh, three RTO timeouts. The next year, uh, 
uh, uh, this behavior was further strengthened. Since uh, this time, uh, the hash is recalculated on each ITO and seen ITO timeouts. And finally, in 2018, uh, uh, there was also added support for the hash recalculation at the receiver side that is triggered uh, by the uh, duplicate segments. And as we discussed, uh, ITO timeout now affects not only the flow label value, it affects all kinds of encapsulations. And a surprise. It have already become the Linux default behavior. So how does it change the life of TCP flows in the data center? And it is interesting because uh, let's once again have the same scenario. We have an outage and uh, X11, it's partial, it drops a subsets of brackets. At uh, this time, we will also add flow label into our hash function of our top of rack switch. And in case of selection acknowledgement, nothing really happens. Uh, but if, if uh, there is RTO timeout, the hash is recalculated. The flow label upon this hash is also recalculated. And so we are getting a 50% probability to jump from the failing path, to jump to another plane. And the more planes we have, the higher is the chance that we will be moved without session, session interruption to unaffected part of the network. Uh, and it is fully transparent for the applications. So it looks, looks rather great. And uh, the last problem is RTO timeout. As we discussed, we are, they are huge. Uh, the RTO mean, it looks like the, it is accessible from the user space and with the IP route uh, tool, you can uh, change it for selected prefixes. But a seen RTO is different. Uh, it is nearly hard coded in the uh, kernel. And the only way uh, to access it, so you can't access it in, from the user space, is uh, using BPF. Uh, to find an example how to change it with BPF is rather simple. So uh, it's just here. Uh, one may easily imagine here uh, how to extend this example to cover, for example, proper prefix lookups. Uh, but let's take a look how uh, uh, it works all together in a real experiment. So we decided not to wait for a next big outage, but to create a small artificial one. So we took a real top of Rex switch with real services uh, and servers inside it and real production, production traffic. And uh, we created a packet loss of on one of four its uplinks. On the left side, you can see uh, the result, the outcome of our UDP-based uh, data plane monitoring tool. It shows just that we have 25% uh, packet loss. It's simple. On the, on the right side, you can see the disruption that happened with uh, uh, service traffic. The traffic volume dropped four times. Now, the same experiment, but with a flow label enabled at the top of REC switch. Uh, the GDP based uh, monitoring tool shows just the same result because it's just UDP ping, it has no information about retransmissions and ITO timeout. But the service traffic not affected at all. So the TCP sessions are just jumping from the failing path and finding the uh, part, of, uh, part of the fabric that is not uh, uh, that is unaffected. And as everything is just looks great. Um, so uh, what one can learn from these slides? Using flow label at the level of top of rack switch, and first tire spines give TCP over IPv6, of course, only over IPv6, the self-healing capability. To make this jump of traffic quick enough, you should use uh, BPF uh, programs uh, to change both RTO and SYN RTO according to your latency. And this goes for free, though with few uh, poo documentation. And one may note 
that an environment with multiple paths is not limited to the data center. Uh, one may say that the internet itself consists of multiple paths between majority of its points. And all this jumping from failing path to an another may improve user experience in general. Here are again some real numbers from Yandex. Uh, let's, uh, less than 40% of prefixes that we are receiving from our peers have uh, only one best path. The average number of uh, best paths is about four. The maximum number of the best paths that uh, exists simultaneously is 44. So it uh, gives a lot of room for jumping from failing path to another one. And here is a real outage. So it was uh, uh, affecting uh, not our direct peer, so we had five alternative uh, best paths and uh, mm, uh, only two of them were really affected while the packet loss at uh, the affected pass was nearly uh, uh, 100 percent and so if everything is that great so we uh, we have already in place flow label. We have hash recalculation. What can go wrong? Unfortunately, there was a trap, and uh, th this trap is called Anycast. Uh, in the DC environment, stateful Anycast services are not that common. While in the wild internet, Anycast TCP proxies are, uh, proxies are representing significant portion of traffic volume. At a, and uh, these proxies and stateful Anycast services doesn't perform well with Linux uh, flow label mechanics. Let me show why. Let's say we have a client that establishes a TCP session with stateful Anycast service, for example, TCP proxy. And everything is fine until ITO happens on the client side. Uh, in this case, uh, the client will recalculate his uh, uh, hash value, and so does the ATO, uh, so, so does the flow label. As a result, uh, subsequent packets can be redirected to another instance which won't have an appropriate state and will drop uh, these packets accordingly. There might be following ATO events uh, that finally return the traffic to original instance. But anyway, it won't improve the user experience. The scenario for the scene auto is a bit more complicated. Let's say again, we have a scene packet and it reaches one of our Anycast instances. And this time it's successful, but uh, the response is not. In this case, when we are losing a scene arc, we have two sides the server and the client trying to retransmit its packets. So after default scene auto timeout, which is normally a second, the client will send uh, another scene packet with a new flow label. And it may reach another instance. But now we will have one client and two servers uh, trying to establish one connection. So we have a race condition. Uh, if the SYNAC is received from the second proxy, everything will be fine. But if we receive it from the first one, we are meeting a peculiar situation. The client needs to send an ARC uh, to finish the connection procedure. But it has flow label that directs packets to the second proxy and acknowledgement uh, a number related to the first proxy. Of course, such scenario will end up with a connection timeout. So if you, uh, in your operations, have experienced more timeouts in IPv4, uh, IPv6 compared to IPv4, now you should know why. And uh, uh, this is no theory. We have experienced this kind of problem with our own Anycast service. So in our case, it was uh, layer four load balances. Uh, to make flow labels safe, uh, at least inside our own network, 
we had to do several workarounds. Uh, first of all, we at the host we uh, set with uh, using eBPF uh, uh, TX hash uh, to zero by default, which prevents it from recalculation. It is paired with explicit hash randomization for traffic uh, uh, that is destined to everything except layer four load balance. We, uh, we also had to disable uh, the use of flow label at every device except top of rack switches. Uh, but all these fixes are no more than a tempor temporary solution because the industry as a whole is moving in a different direction. The server six is getting momentum, but it will effecti uh, effectively once again remove the opportunity to read the transport uh, uh, transport headers by the devices. Uh, so flow label hashing is becoming interesting default behavior. And whatever you do inside your own network, it won't prevent the user TCP sessions from jumping between your points of presence. So it uh, gave us enough motivation to start looking for general solution. First, we, st we started a major redesign of our Unicast services uh, with focus on the layer four load balances. We decided that we want to remove state from there and maybe it's a good talk for another year uh, but we also started looking on how to change the linux defaults uh, to the safe mode well of course we wanted to preserve uh, these wonderful capabilities of self-healing that we already uh, were already using and thought that they are very very important so we made a next observation all issues with RTO and SYN RTO may happen uh, only if hash is recalculated on the client side. And this provides an opportunity for a quick fix uh, that will save improvements uh, in case of outage and resolve the issues with the uh, CP uh, uh, session timeouts. So if we, we just restrict uh, hash re recalculation upon RTO events at the client side, while keeping current uh, behavior for the server side, it may become a proper default behavior. And of course, we want we we love knobs. We want knobs to both to enable it in uh, all cases or disable. Or, uh, or who knows? Uh, this observation was partially addressed uh, in the recent patch by Tom Haley. Uh, who suggested restoring the old uh, default where hash was recalculated after three RTO events. It may solve the problem with uh, TCP connection timeouts uh, uh, at the client side, but decreases the opportunity at the server side, of course. Uh, nevertheless, the patch also uh, made hash re rethink uh, configurable, which is undoubtedly a change for the better. I believe uh, that defaults can still be slightly different. I suggest to restrict hash uh, changing at the client side unless it is enabled at the uh, socket options. Uh, at the same time, we don't see any effects of en uh, side effects uh, from enabling uh, hash recalculation upon first or each RTO event at the server side. Uh, we are planning to send an update to Tom's proposal uh later this week so in ipv6 world tcp transport was enriched with self-healing capabilities it seems to be widely used uh, by several big brand companies but uh, we still have an obligation an obligation to make make it safe in uh general and so to change Linux defaults so that it will not disrupt TCP sessions toward stateful Anycast services. And this time, learning from the mistakes, we need to properly document it. By properly document, I mean document it at high tier. So that's all from me for today. If any questions, I will be glad to answer them.
Thank you, Alexander, for the awesome uh, presentation. Uh, it was really great. Let's wait a few minutes uh, for the folks to uh, ask questions. If there are any, I don't see anything, anyone in the chat. Please, folks, don't be shy. Oh, Eric, Eric has something to say. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about changing Linux defaults, right? Because uh, Linux defaults were changed uh, years ago, so it will take time anyway to get the new default uh, being applied. Uh, on the majority of Linux hosts, right? Sure, sure, you are uh, totally right, but the problem is that the, it will be uh, increasing. So at the moment, for example, when we uh, uh, removed flow label from the hash function at the uh, border routes, it was quite enough to stop uh, uh, user, users from complaining, but as the IPv6 adoption will be uh, in, increasing, plus IPv6 will be, uh, uh, I believe, widely deployed, we will have this problem growing from year to year. And uh, of course, we can't change uh, the behavior of lots of hosts uh, for for a long time. But if we start now. Maybe in a couple of years, so we will have less complaints from the users. I hope I've, uh, I asked or answered your question. Lawrence? Oh, thank you for the talk. Um, I missed part of it, I have to admit, so maybe you've covered this. I'm sorry if this is a, a stupid question. Uh, so it's interesting because I work on a on a stateless layer 4 load balancer at Cloudflare, and we have an Anycast network, so I think we, we probably face similar problems. And we've been having this discussion where uh, there's kind of this anecdotal evidence on the internet that um, there is like bad middle boxes on the internet that will sometimes mess with your flow label, like clients connecting to you to your edge. Um, and then in the middle between, you know, the, the person connecting to your edge, there is a bad middle box somewhere that will change the flow label between the sin and, you know, subsequent acts. Is that something that you've encountered at all or something that has been a problem for you uh, as you did this work? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I do not think we have uh, seen such behavior from the middle boxes. We've seen the behavior when the client side was changing the flow label and it was resulting that the TCP session was ending up at another point of presence without uh, any state. So that was the problem. Uh, so about the flow label, if, if it can be changed by the middle box, of course it can be changed, unfortunately. Uh, it's not immutable, uh, and it was every time it was stated that it is not immutable. But uh, what, as far as I understand, it is uh, not why such behavior is not common at least, and I'm not sure that I understand the use cases where the flow label is changed. And uh, according to the current ITF documents, it's mostly discouraged, by, but the ITF documents are quite confusing in the field of uh, the flow label. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a use case. It's just something that we have we found in a blog post, and so we've held off of using flow labels for this kind of, for load balancing oh, purposes. Yeah. So it's interesting to see your experience. Uh, I put the link in the, in the chat if anybody's curious. But thank you for your talk. Yeah, great. I'll check the link. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I have a PPF-related question. So, uh, 
do you what do you think should be the features that you uh, find that like what you can you suggest can be added for in the BPF side where it overlaps with the networking for this specific use case? Like you're already using it to adjust RTO, or CNRT or like anything else that comes to mind? Uh, so the, thing, the, the first thing that comes to mind uh, that the opportunity to configure the hash thing should be part of uh, BPF uh, configuration because finally we are ending up uh, by configuring the uh several behavior uh, at in the in the dc environment by not um, changing the socket options at all applications by but um, by uh, using the pair programs and you know, on other c groups uh, and uh we are for uh for what i was saying uh, and telling that we are uh, planning to send a uh, update to Tom's proposal, and we have already verified that hash re re rethink uh, in our proposal can be enabled and disabled from the MBPF. Got it. Uh... Makes sense. Uh... I hope so. So if there are no more questions, I'm going to say once again, thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience while suffering from my Russian accent. And hope to see you all one day in person. Absolutely. Thank you again so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it.